All right, welcome back, Trinidad and Tobago. We will get back to that conversation with Rockus about this representative of Trinidad and Tobago talking about, and somebody sent us a correction, the thousands of children. She didn't say hundreds, thousands of children who, who are sleeping on pavement and hungry and can't go to school. All right, but <laughs> for this hour, in this moment, we're going to be speaking with Pundit Narvin Omardath Maharaj, who is of the Sanatan Dharma Mahasabha, to talk about the fact that the government has uh, given them the opportunity to uh, restart open fire cremations, as well as to do that part of their rituals for the burials at the rivers. Good morning to you, Pundit, Pundit Maharaj. Morning, Natalie, and uh, to all of Trinidad and Tobago. It's wonderful to be here with you uh, this morning, and to everyone, I want to say sit around. Ah, uh, thank you so much for joining us. So, Pundit Maharaj, talk to us. What does it mean for the Hindu community to have the resumption of open pyre cremations? Um, Natalie, uh, that's a beautiful question. And uh, when the Sanatan Dharma Mahasabha picked up uh, the issue and it was brought to us in the fall, um, actually, it arose out of a number of families who had uh, quite a few deaths within a short space of time. And uh, they were required now to find uh, funds to, to perform these last rites um, arising out of these consecutive deaths, which took place in a relatively short period of time. That would have been the first factor to consider. Secondly, um, these were low income owners. Uh, so you're talking about families who were uh, barely surviving. They were trying you know, to make ends meet in a number of different ways, working two jobs, pooling resources in different ways. And, and for that family, it's, it's very difficult. So arising out of that, um, we had a number of calls that came to us uh, at the, the Mahasabha uh, from pundits and from families, uh, almost like an outcry that states that, listen, it's difficult for us. We can't, you know, we can't do it. And um, out of that came this public awareness and representation and uh, for those families that like I have shared with you, it yeah. means a, a sense of comfort. Because remember, Natalie, uh, once you have that in your home, you're already uh, emotionally you know, deprived, as the case might be. You're emotionally challenged. You're distraught and, at that moment, having yes, to deal with you you know, losing a loved one. Exactly. And you want to do what you can as best as possible to bring closure. Bring closure in the sense of... Um, you know, that attachment is now being broken in one sense. But secondly, you want to give your loved one the best send off that you can in the best possible way that you can afford to do it. And for all of those families who would not have been able to do that or may have been restricted to do that, um, this is certainly a welcome change uh, for those families uh, to have, you know, some form of acceptable closure and uh, to move on with their lives. So was it just a matter of cost or was it also a matter of ritual? Um, it was a matter of both actually. Cost would have been the first factor to consider because um, remember Hindus have uh, the 10 day rites that have to be performed as well. And they have a 13 day rite. Now, both are associated with some cost. It may not be as much as the funeral, um, but both are associated with, with some level of cost that is attached. and. Uh, uh, with these as well, remember when you have to now take out, uh, you have to expend additional resources to perform a funeral ceremony. Um, you're left with minimal or none at all. Uh, so, for example, in, in the case of uh, a funeral that I would have done in a family, three members of that family died consecutively. A mother, wow. a mother and a daughter. And prior to those three deaths, those were COVID-related deaths, prior to that, the father of that home died, but he died via natural means. So you, you're talking about four deaths in a home where mother is a domestic uh, worker, grandmother is a pensioner, daughter is domestic worker, father was retired. So you have four deaths that occurred in the space of two weeks and three is COVID. So one is normal, three is COVID. Um, so definitely cost would have been the factor, but remember you then have the ancillary rights of 10 days and 13 days to perform for four persons now that is going to take a toll. So what we had to do, and this is, a, of course, in my case, I'm speaking from a personal point of view here. Uh, we had to appeal to members of the public and, and, and those who are associated at the temple that I function at 
and they came together and they pulled their resources together and we were able to help out the families to ensure that those have done have been done and that's what been that's what has been happening uh, across yeah no i have heard people speak about how exorbitant the cost is for uh cremation can you give us an an, an idea of how much it would have cost for open pie cremation as compared to a cremation at one of those is it a, a more a moratorium crematorium yeah yes. I, I, yeah so, moratorium is something completely different <laughs> yeah, <that moratorium>. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. basic a basic open fire cremation can be um from what we have been receiving the little feedback we've been getting is as minimal as five thousand dollars you can get a basic open fire cremation very simple cremation for as little as five thousand dollars in some cases it may vary according to um, the parlors, it may be six, uh, five, so let's say five, six thousand dollars. Um, when you have to do crematorium services, um, that's just one cost. Uh, the crematorium itself, the, the range of cost at the crematorium is between five and seven thousand uh, dollars. There are a number of factors that you have to consider, um, smaller factors that you consider. We were told recently that weight is a consideration, so there's an additional cost if there's weight, um, all of these things. And then uh, in, with a COVID especially, so that's an additional five to $7,000 that you now have to find. So let's say a family uh, were doing a basic funeral at $6,000. Um, and then they now have to find an additional $7,000, that's $13,000 uh, to put out for. And, uh, and we're being, you know, um, we're not being exorbitant here. And uh, then you have other factors that come into play. Remember that person can't be seen, they have to go in body bags. Um, you also have a storage cost that is associated because of the backlog at the crematoriums. And these were the three factors that uh, filtered into consideration. One, the cost uh, of the storage of the bodies that were kept. Um, because remember, the crematorium backlog would have been a little long. Yeah. And so you are looking at an average of two weeks at a storage cost, an additional storage cost of four to 500 uh, per corpse a day. And then, of course, you add the crematorium fee to that. So, so, so there's obviously a cost cost issue. But is the Hindu community does the Hindu community have any concerns about you know COVID and the fact that when you have an open pyre cremation, that you probably have to get more up close and personal with the deceased? Are there any concerns? No, Natalie. What we have been asking for is is the same that is the same guidelines and uh, provisions that have been outlined um, for handling there's an asso the association of funeral professionals together with the ministry of health they came up with uh, guidelines there's a document that they have put out on guidelines of how funeral parlors and uh, families uh, are to treat and meet with the with covid-19 funerals and it's no different uh, we've been doing burials and it's the same that is involved in burials, the same protocols that are involved in burials. We are not asking for the, uh, the, the coffin to be open. We are asking the same guidelines that we follow to, uh, to carry through with burials, to enforce burials, which are, uh, was always being done. It's the same guidelines that we are going to follow uh, for open pyres. The only difference is that instead of burying in the earth, you are using an open pyre but we are following the same guidelines. So we are not asking, I know sometimes uh, I've been hearing in the public there that we are asking for the, the coffin to be opened and all of these things. No, by no means are we asking for those. Uh, what we are insisting on rather, and that was uh, one of the foundation for our application, is that all COVID-19 protocols and guidelines must be rigorously followed. In fact, last night, we had a meeting with the Pandits Parisha. The Pandits Parisha is the arm of the Mahasabha. Um, that the, the Pandits, there's a, an organization within the Mahasabha. There are many smaller organizations, and the Pandits Parisha is one such where we have 150 Pandits that come together and we deliberate on these matters because they go back to the community. And during that, uh, Attorney Dinesh Rambali, who is also a Pandit, was there as well. And he, he made the point explicit, it was very explicit, that we are not out the COVID-19 regulations, we have to enforce them in the same way. And the ceremony itself has been adjusted and catered uh, to work within these guidelines. So the guidelines are in effect the same that we follow for burials, 
they are the very same that we are going to follow for the COVID-19 open fire cremation. Okay, well, I think that would, you know, put a lot of ease in people's minds about, you know, the safety of those of us who are still alive, because the reality is that nobody wants to be able to be at a funeral and trying to, you know, send off a, 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 a loved one and then find themselves in a similar position where, you know, their lives may be at risk. So I'm definitely happy to hear that. But I know that the, the, SD, the, the, Maha, the Sanat and Dhamma Mahasabha had taken legal action against the government when there was just no response to, you know, the, the request to, for the resumption of open fire cremations. What happens with that case now? Um, from all indication, what we have gotten from the Secretary General and uh, the attorneys, we have decided to withdraw from that matter because uh, the idea with it is with putting forth the matter in the first place in that it was a dis disproportionate claim. Um, it was affecting a considerable amount of, of the population, the Hindu community, and not just the Hindu community, because you have lots of non-Hindus now that use cremation as a viable alternative. Um, it's just not restricted to Hindus. Hindus, um, by far in most part, must, must, are, are the ones who perform it, but they are also uh, other religious uh, denominations that also utilize cremation. Um, so in our view, that the purpose for uh, going to court with the, the, the government has been achieved. The ban has been lifted. And once the ban has been lifted, it affords now families the opportunity uh, to do what they have to do and to send off their loved ones, um, you know, and to bring closure to themselves. So definitely, uh, as far as uh, I would have heard at the last meeting, the Secretary General uh, would have given the instruction to the lawyers that now the matter is to be withdrawn. And, and what, what role does the river play in uh, the burial of Hindus? It, you probably can help me to understand it because I know that that was a part of the uh, public health regulations, part of the changes that the Hindu community welcomed. Uh, I just give me the first part of the question, Natalie. No, I was just asking the role that the river plays in your burial process. Oh, right. Okay. So the, the the river doesn't play any role in the burial process. It plays a role in one of the ancillary rites that is done uh, on the tenth day. So from the day of disposal of the body, on the tenth day, uh, there is a rite that is called dashgat. So dash means ten, and, and gat, of course. Um, Site. So on the 10th day, we, we commonly refer to it in Trinidad as the shaving ceremony. Um, that rite has to be done uh, on the banks of a river or on the banks of a pond. So what would have been uh, done, an, an adjustment would have been made, we would have consulted the scriptures. The scriptures become the guide for us in that. So we look into our scriptures and we look for the adjustment. And uh, um, we would have made temporary adjustments because of the fact that the waterways would have been closed. Uh, in accordance with the guidelines issued by, by the Ministry and the Prime Minister. Um, as such, that right has to be performed on the banks of a river. Uh, so that, that is what the, the role of the river would be uh, in terms of the rights, not in terms of the funeral. Right. Um, in terms of the we have uh, disposal of the ashes that takes place and so forth. But um, in remember, only COVID-19 open fire would have been on ban. Normal funerals, persons who are um, would have died by normal means, those cremations continued as usual, so they would not have, have now, been stopped. Let me ask you a peculiar question. I myself am curious. Do Hindus, do Hindus believe that, you know, if there are any changes to the processes that they employ to send their loved, one, their loved ones off, that it compromises their soul? Yes, it does. And that's a beautiful question. Um, we believe in... in the soul's existence post body. So the body is just a means of, of experience, but the soul is actually what, uh, what is of uh, greater interest, yes. And if the rites are not properly performed uh, as prescribed, then yes, it can barely impact on the journey of the soul in the afterlife. You see that, I, I thought so as well, you know, that, you know, I know that like, you know, regardless of the religion or regardless of the beliefs, that we do have beliefs about what's supposed to happen and how somebody is supposed to be sent off. So I'm happy you cleared that up for us. So going forward now, back to the open fire cremations, able to do those rituals, do those rites, everything is okay for the while. 
Yes, for the while we have we have made the adjustment, and as I as I maintained, Natalie, we we have always maintained from the beginning. We have our stated position has always been we will do nothing to contravene the regulations or the health guidelines. Um, that has been the basis uh, of our motives, and it will continue to be. We have uh, strict instructions were and uh, guidelines were issued by the attorney uh, last evening at that meeting. And uh, we have guided the pundits along the path so that they will guide members of the community that those guidelines are not to be flouted in any way. No adjustments are to be made. What as rigorously as possible, we observe those guidelines and uh, we get this process back into motion. Let's see how it works. We are hoping that all will go well. All should go well with this um, because our pundits have been given um, very, very clear directions. Even from a religious perspective, the parishad would have issued guidelines for us on how we should proceed uh, ritualistically with these ceremonies to ensure that there is uh, adherence to all guidelines and uh, to allow, of course, the families to still uh, bring up, do what they have to do and bring about sufficient closure. Yeah. You know, I always thought that when open prior cremations were done, that the body would have been outside of a casket. Has this always been that? Was this like that before because of COVID we're using caskets or mixed all along? No. So in Trinidad, um, in different open fire cremations are done across the world uh, in countries where they're uh, Hindus. Um, but in Trinidad, we have always used a, a casket. We have opened the casket, actually. Uh, the top, the upper portion of the body, the right. casket from the, that that remains open. Sometimes the whole casket, uh, at the cover of the casket is removed, but it's a normal casket that we use. Um, it has never been on a stretch or anything like that. And it, remember, non-COVID-19 cremations still continue like that. Uh, the body is open. You have access to do what your rituals and so forth. Um, actually, the rituals that involve uh, the reason for the body being open is because you have a, a couple of rituals to do that involves um, physical touching of the body right. as well as as the body is prepared to go to mount the pyre um, you have to place certain ingredients so rice sugar um, there's a little lac lac that we call google i think everyone would be familiar with the term google and then of course ghee that has to be placed camphor uh, these are placed on the body cover the body and uh, pieces of stick and then it's placed into the open fire. With the COVID-19, the casket is going to remain sealed and that body is going to stay in the body bag. Yeah. So what we, uh, our suggestion uh, to the funeral home, if it can be done, is to place the Google, uh, the sugar, the ghee inside of the casket. When you put the body bag, seal it inside of there. And then we perform the rites and uh, we use the ghee on top of the coffin so that when burning actually takes place, will and as the coffin disintegrates the ghee will actually get in and soak and filter into the body itself but yeah. by that time uh, by the time that process takes place you are looking at a fire that is almost 500 degrees celsius plus so anything that is caught within there by the time that fire annihilates the outer part of the coffin the body bag and it gets to the body itself you're looking at temperatures of over raging over 500 degrees celsius um so any type of a microorganism that is there would be completely annihilated. I'm not a scientist, of course, yeah. but this is from reasonable observation. All right. All right, Dr. Pundit, we do have to leave it there, but thank you so much for speaking with us this morning. It was a pleasure. Thank you for having me. You're most welcome. Pundit uh, uh, Narvin Omar Das Maharaj there.